Well, good morning. Uh, this is Ms. Dagenford. We're going to be looking at uh, and continuing our discussion on embryonic development. We've already been looking at how the embryo develops and what are the major stages, but now we want to look at how the the areas of the embryo um, are signaled and determined and differentiate. Uh, and the first thing we're going to look at are homeotic genes. Now we're going to separate some of these things out, but really uh, what we want to do is understand at the end that they all interact uh, within um, each other and so it kind of green creates this kind of grand symphony of cellular events. So homeotic genes are going to be uh, very, very involved in developmental patterns and sequences especially. Now, homeotic genes are a set of genes and within them they, we have these genes called Hox genes and it's a reduction of the word homeobox. And these are genes that are highly conserved within species. You can find, um, if not the same, then very similar uh, Hox genes uh, within dog, spider, human, horse. Um, uh, pretty much um, any of the animals that have a uh, anterior posterior axis, these bilateral uh, symmetry. And what these Hox genes do is they regulate the identity of the body segments. So um, they control whether or not an area becomes the head or the thorax. Or, for instance, with with uh, mammals, you know, the thoracic uh, uh, vertebrae, uh, or whether or not something's going to develop antenna, or something's going to develop legs, they confer the identity of the area. Now, they themselves don't create antenna or legs, but they signal, okay, this segment is going to be the leg or the segment is going to have antenna. Uh, now what's really kind of interesting is along the chromosome uh, in these uh, all these different animals, uh, these chromosomes are often set up in a linear fashion so that the Hox genes actually uh, uh, reflect that segmentation. So you can see right here, here's the green Hox gene that confers identity for the head. Uh, and if we uh, sneak down here, you can see the same thing for the rat for a certain region of the head. Same thing uh, here, we're looking at the abdomen and the abdomen, these genes are down uh, near the abdomen and we call that collinear. Uh, and so uh, what is up with these guys? These Hox genes, well, let's take a look at them. Uh, these Hox genes are actually transcription factors. And so uh, I pulled out a couple of pictures that can help us look at these. And there's a region, 180 nucleotides sequence. And this homeodomain, that's kind of the functional area, this 180 nucleotide sequence that would then confer, um, relate to 60 amino acids. And these will bind, and you can see that in this picture right here, this homeobox, this is going to be right in this area that surrounds a region of DNA and it acts as a transcription factor. So it's going to activate other genes. So notice in this picture, uh, let me zoom in on it so we can see it a little bit better. In this picture, it's um, this brown Hox gene is going to bind uh, at the beginning and it's going to bind to something that we've talked about before to these enhancer regions uh, in the DNA and this transcription factor is going to then signal, hey, make, you know, transcribe this gene uh, and now this gene could be then those genes that are going to make the antenna. So notice the Hox gene itself isn't making the antenna, but it's telling those genes that make the antenna, hey, we're going to, we need you. Uh, and notice over here on the right, the orange Hox gene uh, is going to code for a transcription factor that will bind to the leg genes. And then you'd have an enhancer 
region in that portion of DNA that that transcription factor binds to, and uh, and that will match. So these will match, but notice if we uh, pull the orange one over here, it would not match. So uh, that's where we can get the legs in the proper area turned on, but then the antenna in their proper area. Now you can imagine if there's a mutation that would change the sequence that it binds to, uh, you can get a different number of legs or a different number of antenna. Uh, or in the video that we watched, an extra antler developing or an extra horn developing, we saw that in some of the mammals. So those Hox genes are going to be very, very important. Now, here's just one other diagram that shows it in a vertebrae, in a vertebrate, in a mouse. And so you can see Hox5 acts in the cervical region. Hox6 is working in parts of the uh, thoracic region. Uh, Hox9 is going to be working on the lower thoracic and then the lumbar region. Hox10. Uh, the lumbar, the Hox 11, sacral, and so forth and so on. And so we can actually map out what control genes are dictating the development of these. So just to really be clear, the Hox genes are conferring identity of the segment. So um, they're not actually making the parts themselves, but they turn on those genes. So um, what we have found is they're so similar, and here's a cladogram that, that kind of illustrates that th this idea of similarity. They're so similar that we can... Uh, rely on that pretty pretty uh, straight uh, in a very straightforward manner we can rely on it to create these relationships and we can see how all of these body plans kind of work together uh, so much so that in the video now the video that we uh, watched in class it's in our website uh, and you'll see it on the gene regulation in the development. So if you want to review that, um, go to our development and um, development fertilization page and then go to the gene regulation and you'll be able to watch the Hox genes. And what they did is they can actually take a Hox gene from a mouse and this Hox gene is what signals the development of the eye. And they can actually put that Hox gene into a fruit fly. And the fruit fly is, is a variant called an eyeless. Um, and that means it's missing that uh, gene to tell it to make an eye. And these Hox genes are so similar that they've been able to take the gene, the Hox gene for the mouse, put it in the fruit fly, and then lo and behold, that fruit fly develops a fruit fly eye. Now, it doesn't develop a mouse eye, so that goes back to this idea that these dictate what genes get turned on, not the actual eyes. So this isn't the gene for a mouse eye. It's the gene to say, you're going to make an eye. Uh, but that's uh, some of the most uh, recent uh, research within the last few years. They've been able to kind of look at how similar these are. Now, um, Next, we're going to be looking at some of the experiments that they have done to kind of find out how um, all of these cells work together. And you'll see that Hox genes are going to be involved in this as well. Uh, so thank you very much and hope that helped.